welcome to Women's Cricket Chat. I'm Hannah. And I'm Alexandra, Alex for short. Coming up on today's podcast, we've got Nasira Mohammed, who is the West Indies Media and Content Officer. Now, Nasira made a little bit of history by becoming the first woman to hold this position in the West Indies cricket team's 92-year history. Here, Nasira talks about her journey so far and the importance of self-identity. How are you? Quite good. And you? Not too bad. I mean, it's quite grey here today. Yeah, so it's, it's very, very melancholic. <laughs> To Let me show you. I can't. I, I can't. I have no complaints about that, though. Oh my god! <laughs> jealous. That's what, I need. That's what I need. Vibes are insane. I'm so jealous right now. How is the situation where you are? Are you in Antigua? I'm in Antigua. Yeah, I'm based in Antigua. So, what's the situation there like with COVID and stuff? Are you guys okay? Um, or well, compared to the UK, I should say that we're okay in terms of numbers um but there's been a little bit of a spike maybe within the last two weeks or three weeks so we've gone back into an eight to five curfew Mm -hmm. no 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 in dining restaurants at restaurants supermarkets close at 6 30 so it's a little bit of a chaos by the time you're finished working to rush down to get all your stuff done oh it's it's horrible the the beaches are still open so hopefully they remain open (laughs) yeah no that's brilliant at least you've got that because yeah there's not much to do at the moment here it's just go (laughs) for it (laughs) you're you're in Loughborough right so I'm in Loughborough and then Alex you are in South London yeah (laughs) Okay, nice. The funny thing is, like, I've been to Loughborough, right? Yeah. My relatives live in London, but I've never been to South London. Alex will have to take you. <laughs> Next time you're over here, honestly, you'll get the full tour. Once we don't have to live in a bubble, it's yeah. all fine. Our first question is just simply, can you introduce yourself? Well, my name is Nasira Mohammed. I'm the media and content officer of the West Indies women's cricket team. I'm also a media and content officer at Cricket West Indies. So while I'm not on tour or in camp with the women's team, I do corporate communications for the cricket board. Um, sometimes I fluctuate between our men's team as well. Um, as well as the age group cricket. So I do some of the under-19s, under-15s, under-17s. So match reports, photos, videos, interviews, that's my 40. And I believe, didn't you create a little bit of history when you got the job with the men's team? Because weren't you the first woman in its 92-year history to hold that role? Could you tell us what it was like for you to get the role? Yeah, but when I started to work with the men in 2018, it was a first time in um, Cricket West Indies 92 year history of having a media officer with the team that a woman was in that particular role. It's usually filled, well, first off, they didn't have a media officer when, when obviously, when cricket started in the West Indies. But as technology and, and interest and stuff progressed, obviously, you had a media officer assigned to the team. And yeah, it was the first one in 2018. I did, I did um, one, two home series with them, um, Sri Lanka and Bangladesh were here. So I started in June finished in August with them and then I had like maybe one month which I switched back to the women's team because 2018 was obviously the ICC T20 Women's World Cup here in the Caribbean so I did some stuff with the women's team in Barbados when they had a training camp because they were supposed to play South Africa in a series ahead of the World Cup so I did some stuff with them there came back to Antigua for a couple of days and then went to India and Bangladesh with our men's team from mid-September and I came back home in January How do you deal with all of that international travel as well do you love that or do you find it quite hard let me tell you it's 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 a joy to experience because obviously you get to see a lot of different places and stuff like that now a lot of my friends and relatives they think oh you live this glamorous glamorous life that you get to visit all these places and i'm like yeah but maybe four to ten times or five out of ten times you don't see anywhere except the hotel the training grounds and the airport um simply because you have a schedule that you have to work with. So you have training days and a few times that you might have like an off afternoon or an off day. If you really want to get rest or you have other work that you need to get done because as I tell everybody, the players play on the field, they train on the field and when they come off, as it, their schedule is done. They rest until it's actual match time. But for us now who work as the backroom staff, when they come off the field is when our work starts. So for example, if it's a match day, when the game 
time is finished. Obviously, during the game, I'll start to write my match reports or start to do my stuff. But by the time you're finished is when you get access to the players. So then you can get a quote from them. You can get a quote from the coach, whoever it may be. So that's when maybe sometimes three, four hours after a game finish or after a training session finishes, you're still working. So when everybody can go off and go to the mall or go to the movies or just relax, you're in your room doing your work. But it can be hectic sometimes. The From my experience, working with the men especially, if it's a test, test match or a test series, you have longer periods of time in one particular place. If it's T20 or ODI cricket, you sometimes travel every two days or every three days. So you literally cannot unpack your suitcase. You cannot unpack anything because you have to move soon after. But it's it's a really good experience. I mean, I would encourage anybody who get the opportunity to do it, to do it, to experience it. It's not for everybody. But if you know you can handle something like that, if you know you like traveling, if you know you like to do a lot of work, get yourself in it. You obviously mentioned that you get to travel a lot as part of your job. So I was just wondering, where's been your favorite place to visit and why? Without a doubt, Australia. Um, for me, Australia reminds me of back home in the Caribbean because of their very laid back lifestyle. They have a very chill kind of vibes, kind of islandy feel to it, but it's developed. It's like I always tell people Australia is like a first world version of the Caribbean because they have really good beaches, they have good, you know, outdoor activities to do, but yet still they're modern, they're developed, they have good good economies and stuff like that. And I always told myself, I said, you know, if I have to live outside of the Caribbean, there are two places that I'll choose England or Australia. Those are the only two probably. But I mean not knocking this or or you know blocking myself into into a block to say that those are the only two but those are my two favorites what is it about england that you'd like to perhaps come here someday i think because i have a lot of relatives that live there so for me leaving the caribbean um and knowing there are a lot of relatives as well as west indians because there are other west indians that i know that live in the uk um it feels a little bit familiar um for me i'm the type of person that i like to go out and explore i like to walk and see different things so i will tell you like when we come to the uk on tour this is pre-covid times obviously um for example we have a layover that is longer than eight hours so if it's an overnight or if we get in early in the morning and the flight is not until the night, bet your last dollar that I'm on the Victoria Express into London and I go to my aunt's house to get food, home food, because, okay, I live by myself in Antigua, right? And all my family and relatives are back home in Trinidad. So to get my mom's food is a rare occasion. And my aunt is the closest one that cooks to my mom. So when I get to London, I feel as though I'm home, especially when I, because she lives, um, she lives in Queen's Park. So when I get there, it feels like home. So that's one of the things that attracts me to London in particular. I would happily swap with you, you know, <laughs> in a heartbeat. Get me that sunshine and the beaches, honestly. You're and welcome anytime. Honestly, I would love to go. I've never been to West Indies at all. So we interviewed Enid Bakewell and she said the one place she wanted to go would be West Indies because she's never she- been. So I was like, well, we're speaking to you today. Let's make it happen when COVID's gone. <laughs> Let's get in. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> but could you tell us a little bit how you got into the media industry now? What was your access points and where did your passion come from? So I tell people after my family, after God, is cricket, particularly West Indies cricket, right? Like every interview, any conversation that I've had before, you can go back and read it, you can go back and listen to it. It's the same thing. For me growing up, cricket was it. And the ironic thing is I got introduced to cricket by my grandmom and my aunts. Um, because like my grandmom, cricket was the one thing that she used to watch that, that they would what that they would show on TV sport and activity. And in the West Indies, cricket is the thing for us. Um, as you know, the West Indies are several small island territories that make up one sport and body, right? Or one geographic location known as the Caribbean or the West Indies, as some people call it. But the one unifying factor that we have for all of us is West Indies cricket. Um, we all share a historical past in terms of slavery and then indentureship with the East Indians coming across to the Caribbean and various other people, Portuguese, etc. But Cricket is the one thing that we all love and we love to argue about. And the thing is, it's a good argument. Um, because if you go to any West Indian, as we call it, a rum shop or what you all would call a pub, 
in the UK, the one talk that the one conversation that will always come up is cricket. And West Indians are your fiercest and harshest critic that you will ever get. But they're also the most passionate supporters of cricket. And I don't only mean for West Indies cricket, I'm talking about cricket in general, because they will watch a neutral match like Pakistan versus England, and they will have the worst of criticism as though they know these players from when they were toddlers to adulthood. But for me, growing up, that is what ignited my passion for sports in particular. But cricket was my first sport that I loved. And then, obviously, I started to watch football and tennis and golf and the whole nine yards. Um, Also, too, I grew up with a large extended family. I have one sibling, but I have dozens and dozens and dozens of cousins. And we all grew up together, and a lot of us are similar in age. So when it was summertime and you have vacation from school or Easter or Christmas, sometimes it would be 25, 30 of us home at the same time. So you can ask my my relatives, there are lots of broken windows and light bulbs and stuff like that because it's either football we're playing or cricket. So for me, that is what got my my love and interest in sports. Also too, I'm not the type of person that likes to sit down and and chat, especially chat about other people's business or get myself in, you know, confusion or, or what we call in Caribbean bacchanal. Um, that's not my thing. So for me, sports was a way of keeping myself away from that. Um, this might sound very bad, but in high school, it was also a way to help me miss classes because when I played cricket um, and you have training or you have games, you would obviously get exempted from classes. Uh, I remember when I was writing A-levels, I didn't like economics. So my one chance to get away from economics class was to go to score for when our school's boys team had matches at school. So that was my thing, you know, started in scoring and different little things like that. But to get into sports as a career and sports media as a career, I did communication studies at university. And while I was there, I saw that there was a, a vacancy at a TV station, the state media company back in Trinidad. So I said, you know, let me just apply for it. And actually, it wasn't a journalistic job or anything. It was just working at the TV station. The HR manager at the TV station said, you know, I'll keep your stuff on file. So if anything comes up in sports, I'll give you a shout and, you know, see if we can make things happen. So I said, no problem. And it was ironic because I did the inter- they called me back and I did the interview on everything for the sports journalist position. And was my one of my third week, and while I was here, I, I just came. I was actually on the phone with the airline, extending my ticket, the station call, and like, okay, we like what you how you presented at the interview and stuff like that. We like the person that you are and everything. So we we're offering you this position and that's how it started in I can't even remember what year it was no 2013 I think it was yeah 2013 and so I started as a trainee and then six months six months or eight months down the line they took me on permanently and I worked there for just over three years and yeah the rest was history we the West Indies women's team won the World Cup in 2016 so I was a sports journalist at that time and after I mean this is all online so like I I I don't hide it the then president of Cricket West Indies tweeted that you know now is the time to strike basically what he was saying is now is the time to strike with developing women's cricket here in the Caribbean and um, know that they've won and everybody's behind them and etc cetera, etc cetera. and I just tweeted I said well if ever you're looking for a media officer for the team you know give me a shout and he told the person who was the head of the communications department on that time and she said you know send in a resume and if we have a position you can interview for it whatever it is I waited a year almost a year and a half and in 2017 they emailed and they said well we have this vacancy um would you and we have interviews for it would you interview and I said yes and I did and well here I am now (laughs) it always seems to start with an email doesn't it 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 actually started with a tweet yeah with a tweet and honestly like (laughs) Twitter is so powerful isn't it to connect people LinkedIn very much is it's so powerful um but yeah how important is it to be proactive in the sports media industry do you think no the times that we're living in it's extremely um important to be proactive in in um social media and stuff like that especially with sports i think sports and politics are probably the two that can utilize social media the most in getting what they need to get out as quickly as they need to get out because when something happens the fastest way to meet to meet to reach 
at least half a million people in 10 minutes is Twitter. Twitter and Instagram. Um, so, for example, you'll see we post stuff on Wendy's Cricket, which is our handle, at Wendy's Cricket. Um, you'll see when stuff happens during matches, during training camps, tours, etc. I think it's extremely proactive and it's, it, it is important for us as, as media officers, not only the athletes to post stuff on themselves, but us as media officers to use the medium that we have and it's free, which is the most important thing. I mean, nothing is better than something that's free that you can reach half a million people in 10 minutes. So I think it's extremely important, especially the digital age that we're transitioning into, because I can't say we're moving as yet, because there are some people who are still archaic, um, especially the older generation, and they hold out on technologies, um, especially platforms like Twitter and, and Instagram. Well, if they do, if they do start to use it, they use it not as it should, but I mean, we're getting there. So I think we have the medium, so we should take advantage of it. Just uh, picking up on you and your use of social media, we had a little bit of a gandhi, and um, we saw that you posted about World Hijab Day. Um, we wanted to know, what does it mean to you to wear a hijab? Alex, coming in with these strong questions. <laughs> for, me, for me to wear the hijab as a woman involved in sports, it shows that this doesn't limit me to what my aspirations are. Um, because growing up as a little girl, I never wore this when I was growing up. Um, I started to wear this probably 2011. So it will be November this year will be 10 years, actually. Um, now that you have me calculating it. But um, for me, as I said, growing up, my, my love and my passion was cricket. Funny enough, like I never wanted to be a cricketer, but I always want to be involved in cricket. Um, so now that I have the opportunity to wear this, I can show other women and other young girls that, you know, if you want something, it doesn't matter what you wear or what you look like. And that was part of my tweet. Um, to go after what you want. Don't let anybody tell you that because of your religion or because of your headwear, you can't achieve. I've, and I've, I've, trust me, I've had people tell me about it. That, um, oh, you're a Muslim woman and you're not supposed to mix with men. And um, it's not part of your religion. And the first question I usually get from, from people sometimes is, um, does your father allow you to work um, with men while you're wearing hijab? I'm like, I don't think this is my father's decision who I work with or where I work. It's my decision. My father educated me. He grew me up. He taught me what I needed to know, what was right, what was wrong. Um, and everybody have personal boundaries and, and know what, there's, what they stand for. So when people, I, I mean, by now I should be used to it, but sometimes, you know, it just catches you off guard um, by the comments that some people make. But that's what it means to me to, to show, to, to, to be an example to young girls and other women that you know I can do it too so what you're saying is representation matters then definitely representation matters um I know of another hijab wearing uh, Muslim from Canada she's a, a sports journalist Shireen Ahmed um and she's very vocal about it as well she operates on another podca podcast called burn it all down maybe you all could link up she's on my Twitter I mean we all do these things especially for women in sports um but she's quite good about it in terms of speaking about her hijab and being Muslim and being involved in sports. She's very good on football. So maybe um, Alex can chat her up on Chelsea. I have no comment on that because I'm not a Chelsea supporter. Are you a Man United supporter? Pardon? Pardon? Are you a Man United supporter? Definitely not. You know, I swear I've seen you post about United or someone. Who do you support? Liverpool. Liverpool. Oh, yeah, my bad. <laughs> Completely different I, team. I will, I, will, no. I, I will admit I support I supported Manchester United when Dwight York played for them in the nineties, okay. early two thousands because he's my countryman. That's it. See, I knew, but I've definitely seen you post about Man United somewhere. So maybe it was that. I don't know. Um but I just wanna... I probably did, but I don't think it was in support. I mean I would <laughs> I would I would. In all fairness, if I see that there's a good performance or or one of the footballers, you know, for example, like the work that Marcus Rashford is doing, I would comment positively and, and you know, give praises where praises is due. But to say to support, I know I support Liverpool. Yeah. <laughs> all right, we'll forgive you for and that. And sometimes Arsenal. And sometimes Arsenal. How can you support Liverpool and sometimes Arsenal? Though? Arsenal aren't even the best team in London. They're like, well, to be fair, they're better than Spurs. Okay, so 
my main team, my main t- no, my main team is Liverpool, right? But if Arsenal is playing against someone, I would support Arsenal in that sense. But they're not my number one go to. Right, and I have a soft spot for them because Thierry Henry and Patrick Thierry Henry and Patrick Vieira played for them. So I and I support France in national football. So forgive me. Okay, we'll we we'll let you off. Do. Yeah. I just want to bring you back to that status as well um because the three words that you put that really kind of stood out to me was empowered independent and brave tell me what that kind of means to you those three words so empowered independent and brave right um it for me being empowered um it links back to being educated and educated not in the sense of only academia but educated, empowered in the sense that you have an all-round education. So when people come at me with stuff that because of my religion, I'm not supposed to work with men or I'm not supposed to work at all. Um, and then educated academically because obviously I have a degree in communications. I have other certificate courses that I've done. It makes me know what my rights are. So I'm empowered by that, knowing that I'm, and, and it brings me back to being confident where I can stand up for myself and know how I can defend myself when people tell me sometimes what they say. Um, intelligent. I can't even remember what I said. So it was empowered, independent, independent, right. So independent meaning that I can see about myself. Um, as I say, defend myself if need, if defending needs to happen. I can, and this was my, my mother's biggest worry when I moved away from home. Because obviously I was living at home. My mother would cook, not wash. I do my own laundry, but... I mean, she would cook and ensure that I have food and stuff when I was home. So her biggest worry when I left home was, would I be able to feed myself? Um, and sure enough, I think she's impressed with me now by the fact that I can make some things better than her. Um, so I th- that is a little bit of a success story by itself. Um, so in- empowered, intelligent, and brave. Brave in the sense that I took the chance to resign from my job as a sports journalist and take up this offer at Cricket West Indies, move away from home, move away from my family, everybody, and come live here by myself and move into an unknown world for me in working with a team. I mean, sports journalism, you cover a range of sports and different things, but with a team specific, you now become the person on the other side of the mirror if you want to call it that because before as a journalist you can ask the team all these questions be be as you know digging as you want to be with with teams and 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 really ask them the, the tough questions and then now you're part of the team where you have to know how to be a perfect PR answer to the same people that you were before. So what do you think, you've just kind of touched on it, but what are the challenges that you face as a media officer versus to when you was a sports journalist? You know, I think being a sports journalist before and then coming into this job gave me the perfect preparation to handle where I am now because I know I mean I dealt with people like me before so when they come at me with questions I would know exactly how to craft the responses and stuff like that um I would know how to prepare the players in terms of um for interviews and stuff give them an idea of what can be thrown at them um how to not necessarily for them to respond but you can help them prepare so they will have a better idea okay for example if you know journalists like to ask sometimes personal questions or they like to really critique your work and your performance and sometimes when you don't prepare an athlete enough they freeze and they might give an answer that they don't really want to say publicly so for example these little things that I work on with the players and stuff like that to get them and help them to make them more comfortable when they face other journalists so for me I I cherish that experience that I can see it from both sides of the coin so to speak you touched briefly on your journey but I just wanted to know how challenging has your journey been to get to where you are today I can definitely say I'm probably one of the most fortunate people that you will ever meet um, in the sense that it's not been challenging at all. Um, I guess maybe because I grew up, some would say very sheltered um, by my family and stuff like that. So my parents really allowed me to explore what I wanted to do. They never placed me in any kind of restrictions and say, oh, well, you need to be a lawyer or a doctor, whatever it is. No. The funny thing is, when I was growing up, I actually wanted to be a lawyer. I started university doing communication and then the university said um they, they they gave the option that if you wanted to transfer faculties after one year and I said you know 
I kind of like this. I'm not really a desk job person, which is ironic, the fact that I wanted to be a lawyer and I don't like to be tight to a desk all day. So, I mean, the journey to get where I am right now is hasn't been challenging, if I'm being 100% honest with you. Um, obviously, you will learn new things every day. Um, and with each tour or camp or different personalities that you meet because no two people are alike and not everybody shares the same views as you do not to say that there is discourse or anything like that but obviously people see things from a different point of view than you and me being in communications being in PR you have to be adaptable to to, the, to your environment um so for that in itself um you know you you try to be evolving and just as you mentioned how important is it to be proactive on social media which is something i was on twitter probably from i don't know probably maybe late 2000s but it laid dormant for years and then as i became more actively involved obviously as a sports journalist and stuff like that and then now it's like twitter is my go-to every morning when i wake up after i finish pray twitter to see what happened overnight what i missed whatever it is but yeah i i, I really can't complain about my journey so far what's the difference perhaps between the men's side of the game and the women's side of the game when it comes to your job role and another thing is like i I, I guess maybe it's just the players that I work with, but I haven't had any issues with them. I mean, obviously, the men would be a little bit different because when I was on tour with them, there are some of them that sometimes, you know, you would go to the mall with or you might just have a coffee with or stuff like that. Whereas with the women's team, it's a little bit more close and knit family in the sense that um, I knew a lot of them before I actually started to work at Cricket West Indies. So it's just almost as though you're a family. So you would message each other for, the, for each other's birthday or, you know, little things like that. Or when we go on tour, we would have group activities where, you know, some of us might go to the mall, to the movies, you know, get dinner, whatever it is. Little things like that. Or we'd have like little activity nights and stuff like that. I mean, the men's team, you would have birthdays and activity nights and stuff. But it's just a different vibes of obviously being with women as opposed to just being with men because I obviously I was the only woman on a men's team so you know it's just it's just a different vibes but I have not had any kind of challenges or issues with either of them so what what's the highlights what's the fun part of the job as well because I got to be the left for lightning media officer back in the KSL days and we had Hayley Matthews and she <laughs> brought such a buzz to the group it was so funny just talking about like PlayStation and you know players with their inside jokes and stuff like Yep. I find it quite hard to kind of you want to kind of know don't you you want to kind of be in yeah. with the players but then you've got to remember actually no I'm meant to be professional I'm meant to and have small boundaries but like yeah. you say it's such a family vibe and I used to love that so much just meeting all these new players and people yeah. and hearing their stories um so what is your highlight of the job working with both men and the women um I think is is the relationships that you develop with the players um because sometimes you see okay so like pretty men the on the men's team I can tell you like I work with them in 2019 and even until now some of them would still message if it's my birthday or whatever it is they'll message and they say you know happy birthday or for example if I go on tour with the men with the women sorry or whatever it is or I visit one of the other um, islands and the guys and they're there they're at training or whatever it is you know we'll have a little chat a little conversation maybe catch a coffee whatever it is it's that just that relationship that you build with the players and they know that you're not just there in a professional capacity but I mean you can just have conversations with and stuff like that so I think it's that the, the friendships and stuff that you build with the players for me is is, is the highlight of, of working with them both the men and the women um, and you know little things like that because I I remember in 2018 when I was obviously away and the World Cup was home here I obviously wasn't with the team as a media officer and the girls and they would message and they would be like yo you know we we know that you would have loved to be here and stuff like that so they used to still check up on me even though I was halfway across the world with the men's team so it is that little friendship and little things that you develop with the players and as you mentioned you know the playstations and stuff like that and you know we have little little games night where dominoes is a big thing here in the caribbean so we have like dominoes nights so or you would have cards night and you would pair up so sometimes there's this particular game that is really popular in trinidad however the west indies team obviously is not only trinidadians so you would have Barbadians, Jamaicans, Guyanese, etc. So we taught the Trinidadians on the team, taught the, some of the Barbadians and some 
only Jamaicans how to play this particular card game. So you would actually get a game tonight where a Jamaican and a Trinidadian would pair up against two Barbadians or a Barbadian and a Trinidadian. So it's just fun to see, to share with each other like that knowledge and just time and, you know, enjoy it and enjoy each other's music and food. And because sometimes if we're in accommodations where we can cook, you know, we would have a uh, different island night. So sometimes the Barbadians will cook, the Jamaicans will cook, the Trinis will cook. And, you know, we all share with each other. But I mean, in terms of experiences is... You, you really just can't put it into words, that type of camaraderie that you develop with them, especially when you're spending that amount of time with them. You mentioned earlier that before you got your role with the West Indies, that you were, you were a journalist in Trinidad. Um, mm-hmm. I did a little bit of research and I found out that you were, I believe, the only full-time female journalist in Trinidad. So how did it... Sports f- journalist. Sports journalist. Sports. How did it feel being the only full-time female sports journalist? It, it was good. Um, it was good and bad at the same time because obviously I wear a hijab, right? And I'm the only woman reading sports on TV. Plus I wear a hijab. So when you go out, everybody be like, you're a sports girl from TV. So... Sometimes you just go out to get something to eat or some food to eat or you might pop into the supermarket and everybody's like, you're the sports girl, you're the sports girl. I remember one time I went on a work trip and I came back and the, not the immigration officer, the customs officer at the airport, he was like, you're the girl that reads the news. I was like, yeah. He was like, all right, you can just go ahead. I'm like, okay, no problem. No problem. And I just was thrown by. But so, I mean, that works out in your favor. But for me, again, it comes back to the point where I was able to show other young Muslim girls that, yo, you could be on TV too. And that's so brilliant, isn't it? Sorry, Alex. Um, No, I was going to say, it's just, um, it's about breaking down those stereotypes and those boundaries that there isn't one specific way for someone to get a job. Like you don't have to be an accountant or a doctor. You can be a sports journalist on the TV. Yep. And like... a lot of, because I played cricket when I was at uni. Um, and I'm an off spinner. Sometimes the girls on the on the on 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 our team now they they have their jokes sometimes, but every now and then, when but very rarely do I actually take a little session in the nets. Sometimes if they're you know short one bowler or one of the girls want a break or whatever it be. Um, so I throw my hand sometimes, but when like some of the girls that I played with at uni. They would come up to me and they'd be like, you know, so when we finish, it doesn't mean that we just necessarily have to play cricket to be in cricket. I was like, no, you can have other options um, to, to, to get involved. And I said, you know, even if you don't think that journalism or communications might be your forte, learn how to do statistics and be an analyst a cricket analyst or or you know if you like sciences become a strength and conditioning coach a physiotherapist whatever it is but get yourself if you know you want to stay in the industry get yourself certified to be in the industry have you been able to get any of these girls involved with anything that you do at the west indies any kind of work experience any fun stories you can share definitely um like Haley loves photography Haley and shamelia connell who is one of our fast bowlers they love photography so some Sometimes some of the pictures that you would see that we post up might actually be from a player. It doesn't always necessarily come from me. Um, and what I do also is get them involved with interviewing each other because sometimes they would be more comfortable speaking to each other than they would be if I were to sit them down to do an interview. So when we were in England last year to play the T20 series in September, um, Stefani Taylor got 3,000 T20 runs. And uh, what I did was I got Shakira Salmon, who's one of our fast bowlers, to do the interview with Stefani. So it's just an easier flow in terms of the atmosphere, in terms of the questions. Sometimes Shakira might ask a question that I didn't think about asking because they're both playing. They both play the game. So Shakira might see something from a player's perspective as opposed to me from a media officer or with my journalistic background to ask a question based on that. Um, and funny enough, both both ladies, Shakira and Stefani, they did um, sports broadcasting courses last year with Alan Wilkins via the University of the West Indies here. So 
when um, they did it in the summertime last year, so when that tour to England came up, I was like, okay, it's a perfect opportunity for you to put your skills to the test. And that's where I got Shakira to do, I she got she did Stefani's interview and she actually did one with Deandra Dotton. So, you know, to get them a little bit um, interested in it. And yeah, but so Haley does photography sometimes, Shamilia does photography sometimes. If I want like a, a very light, you know, jovial type of interview, Shamilia Connell is my go-to person. She is one of the biggest jokesters on the team. Can bowl at you at 70 miles per hour, but she can also crack one of the funniest jokes that you will get. Um, so when you want to get like a light little session, for example, if they're training or stuff like that, she would be the one I'd give her my phone or whatever it is. She'd walk around, you know, poke fun at them, ask them questions, stuff like that and just get them in the mood. I think that's so important as well because I don't think people do that enough, like empower the athletes to actually take on a role and get involved and be creative because when it comes to team identity, I guess people think about the team culture, the training kind of messages, the vision and the strategies behind it, but they never kind of consult media with that sometimes. So I've been trying to like encourage people like players and clubs to just take a step back ask the athletes what they want and make it happen um so like do you have you seen many people do what you have done previously and do you think it has like you said lots of strengths going forward so you think this is how media should be in the future more players taking the lead actually the three countries that i've seen four maybe that i've seen that they started to do player to player content and stuff like that would be obviously the big four um Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, and England. In- India does it to an extent, but the four big ones are the ones that really take the content and the drive and run with it um, in terms of getting their players to do, you know, unique content for themselves. Um, but Henry does an amazing job with the England women's team. So Henry, um, Sipokazi used to do it for South Africa women's team. She's now with their men's team and she's actually still doing it with, with the men's team in terms of getting the player content, player centric content. Um, and her replacement, Lucy, also gets stuff done. But, you know, it's just that fun that you want them because usually when athletes think of media interaction, they think they're sitting here and there are 15 people asking them and throwing questions at them that make them uncomfortable. And that's why I want them to get to understand that, you know, it's not we're not doing this to make you feel uncomfortable. I mean, yes, it's part of the job. It comes with the territory. But... There's also a fun side to it. So I try to let them experience the fun side of it as much as possible so that when it comes to the official media engagements, it can kind of balance it off a little bit in terms of, you know, that they're not, you know, feeling put off by it. I think it's so important because that athlete education piece, I think, is missing within the domestic game here in England because some of the players just kind of giggle and they kind of close up and they're like, they can't take the interview seriously because they're panicking and they're like, oh my God, it's pressure. But then yeah. when they do that with a friend, they can articulate stuff so clearly and they're yeah. comfortable and they're confident. So I just found that so interesting. And and that's the thing, it, it, it all comes back with your athlete being comfortable to do things. When you create, it creates almost a confidence level and a trust between you and your athlete because they will then know you're not going to throw them in a pack of wolves. So I try to get, try to strike that balance as much as I can. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work, but you know, you, 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 you try. Yeah, with my PhD at the moment, that's what I'm looking at. I'm looking at how athletes deal with social media and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking at trying to argue, like, media shouldn't be feared. It's an opportunity. Exactly. And that is something that I tell tell the athletes all the time. I said, you can use your social media as your building block for your brand. You're part of an overall brand that is Cricket West Indies, but you also have your individual brand. So use it to the best of your ability to promote yourself. If you're unsure about something, I'm here to ask. I'm here to answer your questions. Ask me anything at any time and I will assist you with it. But build your brand, build build your image, put yourself out there. And when you, in terms of sponsors and stuff, somebody will come knocking at your door and you'll get it. You're obviously very close with your family. How supportive were they um, about your career? Because obviously journalism and particularly sports journalism it isn't always a fixed thing so how did they how did they react and how supportive were they and and did they give you any advice I think my brother was most excited about it (laughs) he's four years younger than I am but thinks he's 40 years older than I am 
Um, so he was just excited by the fact that I was leaving home and now my mother's my mother's attention will go back to him. Uh, <laughs> so in 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 that instance, it was it I have never had any kind of um negativity or detraction from my parents or my family in my choices when I did the interview and I got the job offer and I told them my mother was like are you sure this is something that you want to do it's not something that you just think that you're gonna do for the next year whatever it is I'm like mom I've basically waited my entire life for an opportunity like this and I'm not gonna let it pass up pass up um because I had to resign my job in Trinidad to take up this one and she said, are you sure? Because you're going to give up your benefits. You're going to give up everything. I said, no, mom, this is this is what I want. So this is what I'm going to do. And my dad was like, all right, this is this is what you make up your mind for. We're here to support you in anything that you may need or anything that you're unsure of. Or if you think that you can't do it and you need to come back home, you know, we support you with whatever it is. And until this day, they still tell me the same thing. Like I tell you, my mother's biggest worry was the fact that I couldn't cook to for myself. Um, and how I would make out in terms of, and that's just a Caribbean phrase, make out, how I would um, sustain myself um, in terms of eating and stuff. And the thing is, I've been living in Antigua since 2017, the end of 2017, October 2017. So it's going to be four years, the end of this year. And she still worries the very same thing. If it is that I'm eating properly, if I'm sleeping properly, if I'm reaching to work on time, everything that her mother usually worries about, she still worries about it. But honestly, I have had nothing but support from my parents, my brother and my extended family. I totally understand about parents worrying. I mean, I'm 23 and my dad still worries about every little thing I do. I think it's because, though, when I went away to university, I didn't stay at home. I went to university over 300 miles away. So I think now being back, it's a bit of a different experience to when my sister went because she went to university nearby. And also, I completely understand your brother's whole thing about the attention being on him because the way it works in my family is my sister had the attention for about four, four and a half years. And then I was born and I sort of had the attention ever since. I think it's that younger sibling mentality of wanting to be the star of the show. <laughs> and the thing is, like, he still has that because if I go home, like if I'm going home, my mom would know there are certain things that I like to eat, right? So the day that I get home, she'll make those particular things. And then you'll see him post up on his Facebook or whatever it is. Oh, the favorite trial is coming home. So she cooked X, Y, and Z and she has prepared for her. And I happen to pass home and I get, but I don't usually get this. And, you know, I mean, it's just really good sibling rivalry with it. Technology for you, isn't it? It, it, it can be a it can be a positive it can also be a hazard at the same time yeah definitely so especially since covid yeah but i really wanted to know about how covid has affected your year and cricket in the west indies but also obviously you came over back in september for the series how did you find it it actually wasn't bad you know i mean i tell a lot of people yes we lived in a bubble we couldn't come out and go down the street to get a coffee or whatever it is but it wasn't bad because the facilities that were prepared for us by the ECB was really really um fantastic in the sense that they had like a games room set up they had a dining hall um we had a team room where you know we would get together and just sit and chat and play music and vibes with each other and stuff like that or we'd have um a games night where table tennis apparently was the sport to try to beat each other um table tennis and and um build uh, darts darts we had quite a good competition with darts and table tennis um but it was really really good um i would be honest it was probably one of the most relaxing times for me in a sense that i guess you know you you train because you literally just walk across from the hotel to the ground you train you come back you play whatever it is and it was just it was just relaxed you didn't have to worry about if you were to go out and you know interact with other people and stuff but it was it was good for the most part for that tour um home here in the caribbean it affected cricket because obviously we're not one landmass we're separated um by islands and so air travel to certain parts to certain islands 
were restricted and are still restricted. So, for example, I'm from Trinidad. The borders in Trinidad are still closed. Um, so you have to apply for an exemption from the Ministry of National Security to go home. I was one of the fortunate ones who applied last year and I got an exemption to go home to, to, to visit my family because, I mean, Antigua is maybe like an hour, an hour and 40 minutes plane ride from Trinidad. So usually I'd go home like every three, four months to visit my family because I have a granny who is suffering from Alzheimer's. So, you know, you try to go home as often as you can to visit and stuff like that. And last year was the first time that I didn't see my family in a really long time. It was almost like a year that I didn't see them. Um, because when we came back from the World Cup in Australia in March, I was supposed to go home and then they closed the borders. So like a couple of days before I was supposed to go home. So I didn't get that chance. Um, so it was a little bit frustrating. I mean, and then living here by myself, not seeing my family, you would have restrictions in terms of curfew and stuff here in Antigua. So it was getting a little bit um, anxious in the sense that you don't know when things are going to go back to normal. Even now, you don't know when things are going to go back to normal or when the borders are going to open. So even though I got to go home for Christmas, I don't know when next I'm going to see my family in in real because I mean you can talk to them on Zoom or WhatsApp or FaceTime or whatever it is but it's not the same feeling as if you were to sit and have an in-person conversation with them um, but cricket in general obviously you would have restrictions where you know governments would put restrictions where you're not allowed to have training outside but that has all been relaxed a little bit in some of the territories Barbados actually, unfortunately is on lockdown right now because their COVID cases had a spike um, um, in January, but that's why we have all the women's players here in Antigua. They had a camp that's finishing this week. They're going to go back home. Um, we have the men's Super 50 tournament, which is our regional 50 over competition for the men. It's happening here in Antigua. And then we have Sri Lanka men's team um, coming shortly. But I mean, it has affected cricket in the region, but we all, and as I always say, we as West Indians are resilient and we always find a way to make the best of every opportunity or challenge that comes our way so even though we might not be able to gather in groups to train as a team every individual still puts in whatever work that they need to do so that when we get the chance to come together as a team we're ready that is such a perfect way to kind of conclude now as well like that's the drop the mic moment isn't it that's <laughs> Absolutely. We've got a few, literally just like 60 seconds, just really quick questions. Uh -huh. And then we'll let you escape. So Alex, do you want to start? Of course. With... Favourite genre of music? Soca music. It's native to the West Indies. Favourite player? Current? Women's yeah. or men? Let's have one of each. Stefani Taylor, Kane Williamson. Last book you read? I don't think I can use the word online. It's, it's an expletive. What about sledging? What's your favourite bit of banter or sledging term? That's all you can do. Favourite music artist to listen to? Jesus, please. Um, Bob Marley. Favourite food? Dal and rice and curry chicken. My mom's curry. Favourite uh, Liverpool player? Oy, oy, oy. You're going to make me think now. Mo Salah. I'll give a current one. Favourite colour? Mm. Favourite food that's not your mum's cooking? Doubles is a Trinidadian dish. It's two flat fried flatbread with curry chickpeas. I need to get get over there ASAP. Honestly, COVID <laughs> needs to go. Like, you're hitting me in all the taste buds right now. I'm like, I love curry. I lo just love, honestly. Um, I think that's probably any others, Alex, or? Um, no, just quickly, where can our listeners find you if they want to keep up to date with all things Nisera? Twitter. Twitter is probably my most active social media account and it's just at Nasira Mohammed. I'm also on IG but I'm not frequent enough on IG but Twitter. Perfect and thank you so much for coming on. On Twitter they'll get pictures of West Indian food, West Indian music everything West Indian. Definitely have to check it all out. No worries, anytime. Perfect, thank you so much. Have a lovely rest of your day. Likewise, take care. Bye. Bye. Cheers. Bye. Massive thank you to Nasira for coming on and being a guest on the podcast. It was so refreshing to hear her speak honestly and openly about her journey so far. And it turns out social media is useful for something, getting a job. And to all our listeners, if you want to keep up to date with everything we're doing, you can follow us on Twitter at WCricketChat and on Instagram at Women's Cricket Chat. And if you want to give us a like on Facebook, we are Women's Cricket Chat. And if you wanted to give our personal Twitters a follow, Hannah is at HannahT1194 and I'm at Alex Jane Pereira. This has been Women's Cricket Chat. Tune in next time.